wife, and the kids. And uh, so this week, actually, we're going to be talking about working relationships, that employee-employer relationship. And so for people that think that the Bible doesn't, you know, doesn't talk about certain things or certain issues, the Bible you know, talks about everything you know, that we need to know. And so this morning, it's going to talk about um, the employee-employer relationship because how many of you know that we obviously need to learn what the Bible says about those relationships because I don't know about you, but I've been out it, you know, it, around town about how many times I've heard a person basically have the attitude of, don't, uh, you know, I don't care, I just showed up, you know, like that attitude of, hey, um, you should basically just do whatever I want you to do because I'm here, I showed up, and give me money. I mean, that's basically the attitude for work, and that's not supposed to be our attitude for working. Our attitude is, you know, for working, I'm going to get into, you know, here in a moment, but I just want, you know, us to make sure that also working for the government, or sorry, getting paid by the government is not work. Um, and we'll see that here in a moment. Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse 5 through 9, and I'm going to sp- uh, explain that here in a moment. But it says this in verse 5, it says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according uh, to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with uh, eye service as man-pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, uh, doing the, the will of God uh, from the heart, with, uh, with good will doing service, as, uh, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he uh, be bond or free. And ye masters do the same, thing, uh, same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there uh, their respecter or respect of persons with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, that your word... Lord, uh, shows us, Lord, how to live, how to live this life. Lord, in every single area, um, it does not matter. Your word has something to say on that subject. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said before, last week, we saw that the Bible, uh, uh, we saw from the Bible, the Christ-centered family, and that if the family is biblically correct at home, that then the church will be correct uh, when we come together. And so this week, we're going to look at the workplace and how that employee-employer uh, relationship can and should be biblically cr- uh, correct as well. Now, uh, the first thing we want to look at is that employees should work as unto the Lord. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you should be working as you're working for the Lord, not for your employer. You say, well, that's kind of hard when they're yelling at me. No, you're, you're supposed to, you know, just, you know, the Bible says that we are to work as unto the Lord we see that in verses 5 and 6. It says, servants, and you say, well, I'm not a servant. In this context, that's what Paul is talking about. When he talks about servants and masters, he's talking about that employee-employer relationship and how we're supposed to, uh, to treat at that, you know, at that moment. And some people will say, well, he's talking about bond or free. Well, yes. We don't see in America nowadays, we don't see uh, any kind of slaves you know, that are out there, but most people are out, out there working and everything else, unless someone is sold into slavery, in which we know that there are sex trafficking, in which I uh, spoke about that a few months back, and how that's wrong and that that should not exist. But it says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And so what we're going to see here, I'm going to go back and forth, like I said last week, with uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 echoes Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 as well. And so Colossians chapter 3 Verse 23 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters, in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Well, it says, uh, number one, it says to, that we are to be obedient. So what does that mean? Well, in Scripture, and this is according to Webster's Dictionary, it says, In good or godly men, the fear of God is a holy awe or reverence of God and his laws, when, uh, which springs from a just view of, and real uh, love of the divine character, leading the, subject, the subjects of it to hate and shun everything that offends such a holy being, and inclining them to aim uh, at perfect obedience. And so the Bible is telling us there's obviously a different aspect of fear. When we hear of, like, 
You know, obedient, it, the Bible equates that to being the fear of the Lord. And somebody says, well, I thought that God was a loving God. He is towards those that love him. That's where most people understand, that, well, he's a loving God. He never sent anybody to hell. Well, yeah, if you're a believer, he's not going to send you to hell. If you're not, he, you know, a just God has to because there's a requirement that he has for his law, all right? And so what we see is that the fear of God is a holy awe or reverence of God and his laws. And because we are to be obedient to the Lord and to fear him, this will spring forth love, uh, you know, us to love everything that is godly and to hate everything that offends him by pushing us closer to him. As we get closer in our relationship to God, we will begin to hate those things that God hates. And we will begin to love those things that lo- you know, God loves. And we, uh, we'll begin to like, want to push ourselves away from those things that are going to distract us from the Lord, and we're gonna wanna draw, you know, it's going to draw us closer to him. Make sense? As you begin to find, uh, you know, and this kind of you know, uh, mirrors you know, the husband-wife relationship. As we you know, get older and we begin to love our spouses more and more, you know, we bypass the things that maybe used to irritate us about them. Or we just, you know, you know, point them out, but we still love them, you know, nonetheless, right? Because, you know, everybody knows about those little butterfly feelings that everybody has about, you know, you know, that person that they love. You know, they go, oh, that's so cute. And later on, it begins to annoy them. But then as you, you know, grow in that, you say, you know what, I love them no matter what, even though that, that annoys me to no end, right? I was hoping to hear an amen on that one, but amen. amen. There we go. All right. So as we, as we grow, you know, as we grow in our relationship, we're going to begin to say, you know what? You know, I don't want to do the things that annoy the other person or that the other person hates. We begin to say, you know what, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, do those things and we, you know, draw closer. Unless you're like an antagonist and then you really want to actually do those things. But it actually should, and the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the way, uh, the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. What's a froward mouth? I'm going to get into that here in a moment. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6 says this. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, or sin is purged and put away with. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So as we draw closer to God and as we you know, uh, you know the Lord and what he would have for us, we're going to want to shun evil. We're going to want to stay away from it. because Why? Because we love the Lord. We want to do what pleases him. And we want to follow him. So, but the fear of God to the unsaved means this. Because the fear of God is twofold. On the saved side, God you know, wants you to you know, draw closer to him, right? You know, if you give your life to Jesus Christ, he wants you to draw closer to him, stay away from evil and all sorts of stuff. But the, the fear of God to, uh, to the unsaved is actually, the Bible refers to it and references it as being a terror. It also means a shorter life. And the, uh, and the best thing that you get is this life. Do you know that? That for the unsaved, the best thing you're ever going to see in, uh, ever is this life. And you go, well, this life stinks. Well, you know what? That's the best it's ever going to get because if you go on you know, to live your life you know, unsaved and away from the Lord, the next place for you is going to be you know, in hell because God has to satisfy you know, that just law that he has. But you know what? If you're saved, this is the worst place. This is the, the closest thing ever that you're ever going to get to hell because it's only going to get better when you're saved. The other thing is that it says they receive destruction and they receive hell. We read this in Proverbs also, uh, chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. It says, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days, means that you're going to get a longer life. A lot of people, when uh, they live an unsaved life, they live a shorter life because their life is in despair. They don't know what to do, and their life is actually shorter uh, in that. It says, uh, uh, continuing in verse 27, it says, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. The hope of uh, the righteous shall uh, be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. The way of the Lord is uh, strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to those, uh, shall be to the workers of iniquity. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inherit, uh, shall not inherit the, the earth. And so we see this, that that's what God, you know, is talking about. He's saying, you know what, if you know, if you're if you're saved, the fear of the Lord is that you have a holy awe, and you're going to want to you're going to want to follow what His Word says. Some grow faster. Some people grow faster in the Lord than others. Some have been growing in the Lord for 40, 50 years. Some have not grown in 40, 50 years, and you can kind of see how they you know are. Is that 
it's kind of weird to see a, a baby Christian when they've been following this, you know, they've been following the Lord for 40, 50 years. You know, the Bible says that you should be off the milk and you should be actually on to the spiritual meat. You should actually be on the meat of his, his word. And the Bible says uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it says basically the reason why we follow God's word, why we should follow what God's word, why we should be obedient to God's word. It says, let as many uh, servants uh, as are under the yoke uh, count, the, count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his uh, doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that uh, have a believing masters, let them, uh, let them not uh, despise them uh, because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, uh, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. But uh, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the do- uh, into the doctrine which is according to godliness. So the Bible says that basically that in this, that when we live our lives according to what God's word says, our bosses, those over us, should not say, you know what, I don't want anything to do with their God. Because their life, you know, looks nothing like how Jesus is. And you're going to have ones out there that hate God no matter what. But the thing is, is that he's saying, you know what, you should live in such a way that they don't even, that that accusation is not even, you know, that actually accusation should not even come to their mind. As well, it says that you should not be blasphemed. And that word, you know, blasphemed is just, you know, that they would actually hate God even more because of you. And in Titus, uh, in Titus chapter 2, it says that we are, incur- we are to encourage and build up employees to be obedient to their employers because we display the excellence of Christ's doctrine. What does that word doctrine mean? It's like the teaching, learning, and knowledge that we get from Christ. The way that we live should honor Christ. And in uh, 1 Timothy, it says that we are to give honor so that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed or reviled. We are to live in such a way that others would not blaspheme or revile his name. I used to, you know, work at, at a Steak and Shake, actually, when uh, I was younger. And other ones, I would work around ones, and I never really, you know, made somebody, you know, not swear around me. Because sometimes you have people say, well, you know, I want you to just ask them not to swear around you. Well, they began to, to notice that it bothered me when they did it, but I never said anything. I, I mean, I never went, oh, my goodness, I cannot believe that you ever said that. I just, they just knew that it bothered me. And after a while, they stopped doing it. They stopped wanting to do it because, because they knew that I was a believer. They knew that I was a believer and that I was different than some of the other ones, you know, that said that they were a believer, but, you know, went around and did the same things as they did. They said there was something different about him as opposed to, you know, as, the, as to them. And this is not a pat on my back. It's just the fact to tell you that when you begin to, to live how God would have you to do it, they'll begin to notice and they won't want to do it. They won't want to blaspheme God's name. Um, they'll want to actually follow him. And, and the thing is, is that we shouldn't do any of this. We shouldn't live as a Christian, as the Bible says, you know, for eye service or be man pleasers. We're not doing it so they'll go, oh, you did a great job. And that's a hard thing because sometimes when we're working so hard, we want a little pat on the back, don't we? Don't we want you know, somebody to say, hey, you're working really, really hard and you're doing a really good job. And I, what, you know, we want that, but the Bible says that we shouldn't seek that. That we shouldn't seek for people to just see us. We should just be working hard. Why? Because we're working for the Lord and not for them. We're working to, you know, uh, to be you know, the best possible worker that they have out there. Now, is it wrong you know, if somebody comes up to you and gives you a pat on the back? No, it's not wrong. But you shouldn't be seeking that. And you shouldn't go up to them and be like, no, 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 no. I don't want any credit for what I got. You know, please don't you know, praise me. Just go up there, take it, say thank you, and move right on. Or thank you, I appreciate that, move on. That's all we should. Uh, that's the way we should be doing it. But what happens if our employer is froward? And that was the word that, that we saw in Proverbs. Um, well, that word froward. It's not a word that we necessarily use nowadays. You know, a froward person. But that word, you know, simply means perverse. Uh, synony- is a synony- synonymous with the word vex, which means to, to irritate, uh, to make angry, torment, harass, disturb, agitate. Uh, trouble, distress, or persecute. The Bible says, you know, says that we are not supposed to be that way. But what happens if your boss is that way? What happens if your boss is not saved? Well, First Peter chapter two says this: Servants, be subject unto your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle. So that would be those that are uh, believing the Lord. Those are, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy, if a man, uh, for conscience toward God. Uh, endure uh, grief, 
suffering wrong, uh, wrongfully, for what glory is it? Uh, what, sorry, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your uh, faults, ye should uh, ye shall take it patiently? But if, but if uh, when, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. How many of you you like having sinus issues? <clears throat> All right, let's try this again. All right. For this is uh, thank uh, thankworthy, if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, when uh, ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall uh, take it patiently? But if, uh, when we uh, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it uh, patiently. Uh, this is acceptable with God. For even uh, here, uh, hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So what does it tell us here? It says, even if we are buffeted. What does buffeted mean? Buffeted means even if we're, if we're struck or we're beaten, the Bible says that we are to do what? We are to take it patiently. Now, you say, you know, I'm not going to take anything from any person. The Bible says that we're supposed to take it patiently. It says that even if we endure grief, suffering wrongfully, it says what? It says, for this is, what, thankworthy, meaning it's worthy of thanks. Because, you know what, we're still working, we're still uh, working towards those things, and yes, am I saying that it's okay for somebody to, to, to beat you, to, to, to hit you? No, it's not. But the Bible says, you know what, that we should take it patiently. Do you know why? Because the Bible also equates that with you suffering for Christ. And the Bible says, you know, that if we, that if we want to live, you know, godly in Christ Jesus, we shall suffer persecution. Now, I am saying, you know, I, I do say this, that if somebody is doing that to you, you should probably report them, you know, for that. I'm not saying you should just be sit over there and just keep your mouth shut in the entire time. You should probably report them if they are doing that. But the Bible says that, you know what, we should suffer, you know, that we should take it patiently because we are suffering persecution for Christ's sake. Because we are believers. And most likely that's the reason why they're doing it. They're, they may not understand what the reason why they're doing it, but they're doing it because you stand for something. So what if your employer tells you to do something that's against the Bible? Don't do it. If the Bible, you know, if somebody comes up and it's on your time, I understand that if, if you're on, their, uh, on the clock, you know, do whatever they ask you to do as far as that. But, like, if they're saying, like, you know, go out, you know, cuss, swear, smoke, you know, drink, do all this other stuff or whatever that you know that you have a conviction about, then you should say, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. They shouldn't force you to do something that you don't want to do. And if it's against God's word, especially, like, I want you to, you know, take God's name in vain. Well, you're not going to do that. Why? Because... The Bible says not to do that. But I also think of uh, Daniel and also Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you watch VeggieTales, Rakshak and Benny. Because their boss, their employer, King Nebuchadnezzar, told them to do something that the Bible said for them not to do. And they didn't do it. They did it with respect and with honor towards their employer, but they, didn't, you know, but they still did not do it. They, uh, Daniel was asked to pray to a false god. He was asked to pray to Nebuchadnezzar. And the same thing, and uh, Red, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were asked to worship an idol. This is in Daniel chapter three, uh, 2 and 3, if you want to read it. But they were asked to worship an idol. They said, you know, bow down this time, this, this image, in which it so happened, that same image was of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a little thing of arrogancy and pride. When it came to himself, they asked him to do this, and they said, you know, with all due respect, we're not going to do it. We serve a different God. We serve, you know, a God, you know, and they began to testify about the God that they, you know, they believe in. And the thing is, is that, you know what, because of this stance, I personally believe, I personally believe due to their, their stance that because of that, they stood against the king and said, you know what, we're going to stand for God and what the Bible says. I believe that that ultimately led to King Nebuchadnezzar's salvation. And it's based on a confession that Daniel makes or, you know, in the book of Daniel, chapter 4, verse 36, which says this, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he, shall, uh, he is able to abase or bring low or humble them. 
And so I believe that because of the way that they, uh, both of these you know, groups of people, you know, one was Daniel in the lion's den, and the other one was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown in the fiery furnace, and that God, you know, out of that entire situation, brought them through. Daniel didn't come out with one bite mark on him, and you know, uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not come out. Even, it says that their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. And he recognized that the person, you know, the, you know uh, he recognized that there was three in there, but then he said there's a fourth one in there, and he recognized that it was who? That it was the Son of God. And so my belief is that because of the, you know, their profession of faith, I mean, because of the way that they lived and everything else, that they got, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar ended up getting saved because of that. Now, you can hold a different, you know, view if you want to and say no or whatever, but, you know, I'm saying that's my view, that they, uh, that there was salvation uh, because of that. Next, I want to talk to you about it's not all about the money. It's not all about the money. We'll say, well, I got to make money in order to live. I understand that. But some are so driven by what you know, by money that they never they never see their families, they never you know go to church, they never do anything because of the fact that I have to go to work. They're married to their job. They're not married to their spouse. They're not married to their family. They're married to their job. And that's that's the problem. Is you know uh, in Matthew chapter six uh, verse twenty four it says, "No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other." You cannot serve God and mammon, or another word for mammon is riches or wealth. You can't serve both God and money. You should make, you should, uh, make money subject to what you want to do for the kingdom of God. And remember, money is not the issue. The Bible says it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. When you become so focused on, I need to make this much money, I got to have this kind of car, I got to have this house, I got to have bigger, 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 you're never going to reach it. Because every time that you get to that goal, you're going to go, well, then you know what? Now I need a bigger house. Now I need a better car. Now I need this, this, this. If you have a roof over your head, you have food in your belly, and you know, have a way of getting around, then I think you're doing pretty well. And don't sit there and you know, make fun of somebody you know, just because their car isn't you know, the, the newest thing. You know, my wife and I, prior to, the, prior to me, uh, you know, get having a, a truck, which is a 2008, I had a 2003 Honda Accord that had, I think it was 240,000 miles. And it still could have went. The only reason why is because a, a, an opportunity presented itself for us to get this one where we didn't have to owe any money on it. That should always be our goal, is to pay cash for everything. That's one of the things I, I found out about, uh, you know, about uh, Mr. Bobby back there, uh, McKegg, is that he doesn't pay for anything on credit. He pays for everything in cash, which I respect, because that's what we need to do. We need to you know, sit there and say, you know, I'm not going to take out a credit card. I'm not going to do this, 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 because credit cards want you to do that. Why? Because they make money off of you, more than you'll ever pay. And so that's why you should never do that. You know, it should never be about the money. If you can't afford it now, save up, and eventually one day you will be able to. Of course, in the economy right now, it might take you about 10 years you know, or longer to, you know, than before. But it's not all about the money. Whatever you place first in your life, you serve. If you, don't, uh, if you place God second, third, fourth, whatever, something else is going to take you know, that place, whether it be your wife, you know, your spouse, or your kids, or money. You say, well, shouldn't I care about my, my spouse or my kids? Yes, when God's first. It should always be God is first, your relationship with God, then your spouse, then your kids, then your family, then your ministry, then church. You say, well, why is church so far down the list? Because those other ones should be your ministry. That should be you know, something that you all, when you have all that in line, everything else is going to come into place. Everything, when you have everything in order the way it's supposed to be, everything else is going to fall in place, including your job. Including your job. How you live your life has a dramatic effect on those around you, including your, fam- uh, your family and your coworkers. Your coworkers, you know, will begin to realize and know that how you live is what you covet or what you love. And that if you say, you know what, I'm going to be here no, you know, no matter what, whether it be for overtime or whatever, I'm not saying that you can't do that, but the thing is, is that eventually, if that's your whole life, I'm going to work overtime all the time then when do you have time for your family? When do you have time 
you know, for your spouse? When do you have time, uh, you know, for, you know, church and, and those things that, you know, that you say that are, are precious to you? How you live your life shows a lot about you. That's all I'm saying. The other part of this is it's about, your life should be about the fact that it's about serving the Lord and saving souls. That's your whole your point. Well, I need to make money. Yes, you do. I understand that. You got to be able to live. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, though, when your purpose is, I'm going to serve, my, uh, you know, serve the Lord at my job, and I'm going to you know, talk to as many people about the Lord as possible, the Lord is going to open up doors and opportunities for you to go through. Now, some people will say, well, how is that possible? Because if you're working as unto the Lord, your boss is going to see it because you're going to be the one that's going to be working harder than everybody else. You're the one that's going to be, the doors are going to open because your boss is like, I can trust them. I mean, think about all those ones that maybe don't receive a, a promotion because they, you know, they occasionally you know, want to steal something or they lie about something or they do, you know, they're lazy. But if you're working as unto the Lord, you're not going to steal. You're not going to be lazy. You're, not gonna, you're going to suddenly go out there and do your job. And they're going to see that. They're like, hey, they come, they work, they do their job, and they get it done. And how many bosses want that? A lot, especially nowadays. There's, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of people nowadays that, you know, basically if, if, if they show up, could be, you know, I didn't say on time, but if they show up, they feel like, hey, you know what? I'm here, you should be blessed because of the fact that I just showed up just by my mere presence, and which is a sad situation to be in, that we have, you know, that there are jobs out there that people, you know, treat them that way. It's about, like I said, about serving the Lord and seeing souls saved. Uh, verses uh, 7 and 8 of Ephesians, it says this, with good will doing service as unto the Lord and not uh, to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So it says, you know what? You do that good thing, it says that, you know, the same, you're going to receive the same thing back from the Lord. The Bible also says that you reap what you sow. Like, think about it. Like, it's harvest season right now. People planted stuff for cotton. People planted you know, seeds for you know, soybeans. Did you see them getting grapes out of those? Did you see, you know, all of a sudden... Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of like candy corn coming out of them. No, it'd be nice, maybe. But the thing is, is that you reap whatever you sow. So if you keep on, you know, sowing like dissension and anger and all those other things, what are you going to reap? You're going to re reap all the ben all the benefits of that anger and rage and all that other kind of stuff. But if you go in there and you're hardworking and you do those things, you're going to reap those benefits of being a hard worker, as well. And so. We see in uh, Matthew chapter 5, it says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You're going to get persecuted because you're a believer. You will. The Bible says that, that if you want to live, you know, as I said earlier, if you want to live a, a godly life in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer what? Persecution. It's going to happen. But he says, you know what? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad because you know what? They did the same thing to the prophets. They did, they've done it before, they're going to keep doing it, all the way up until Christ comes and the, uh, the judgment comes. Matthew chapter 10 says this, He that receives a prophet in the, uh, in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives a righteous, uh, righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And uh, whosoever shall give uh, to drink unto uh, one of these little ones a cup of cold water in, uh, in the name of a disciple... Uh, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So the Bible says that if we're, if we, if we're doing good, we're not going to lose the reward from that, the benefit that, you know, that we just did. So if we give out good, and we're going to receive good, and we're not going to lose that reward out of that. Matthew chapter 16 says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now, you notice that it does not say whether they're good or bad, but he's going to reward you for it, for what, you know, uh, whether you did you know, bad. The Bible says that you can actually lose uh, rewards by the way that you live, and if you don't you know, follow what, the way that God wants you to live. But the thing is, is that what we need to realize is in our relationships, that we, in our working relationships, we need to honor the person that's over us. I'm not saying bow down and worship and say you're the greatest boss ever, 
I'm saying that you need to respect them enough, you know, that when they ask you to do something, you just go ahead and do it, whether you agree with them or not. And I believe that's what the Bible is telling us here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that uh, he has done, whether it be good or bad. So we need to realize that no matter what happens, that we are to live as unto the Lord. We are to work as unto the Lord. That no matter what we do, whether we're the boss, there's always somebody on, you know, on top. We may be the, you know, the manager, but there's always the CEO. There's always somebody above you. You say, well, I'm the CEO of the company. Well, then you got the government. And then, you know, you just, it just keeps on you know, going and that we need to respect those ones are, as well. Number, uh, number six, employers, employers, bosses are no different than their employees. Employers are no different than their employees. Some think that they are better because they're in a higher position than you know, somebody else. I'm making more money than you. I'm doing all this. You are no different than your employees. And that's what I want you, you, you know, the entire time I've been talking about how the employees are supposed to uh, you know, treat their bosses. This is now how the bosses are to treat their employees. Verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 6 says this, And ye masters, do the same things unto them. What is he talking about? All the stuff that I just talked about, he says you're supposed to do the same things to them. You're supposed to treat them the same way. Forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. It says that we should do the same things. We should work as unto the Lord. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. We are not to do it. We are to do uh, everything we do as unto the Lord. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says this, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any work would work not, sorry, would not work, neither should he eat. That is something that needs to be talked about. That's something that I talked about, you know, earlier. If you are, you know, okay, and I'm going to preface this. This is the whole thing, you know, with the government. I understand that some people have a job, plus they get stuff from the government because things are not quite, you know, I understand that. I'm talking about the fact of just sitting on your rear end at home, you know, watching, t you know, TV, you know, while you're waiting, you know, for money to come in from the, you know, from the government. And I understand if you're in between jobs. That you're, looking, that you're looking for a job. You need to be looking for a job while you're, you know, while you're going. You can't be like, well, I'm just waiting for a job. And you're sitting on your rear end doing nothing. Waiting, you know, like, I'm just I'm looking for a job. Somebody's not going to knock on your door. Do you want a job? I can guarantee that they will not. You know why? Because you're lazy and you're sitting on the couch. It's plain and simple. Go out, get a job, look for a job, and you know what? Don't be so prideful and arrogant to say, well, you know what? You know what? I could have got a job there, but, you know, I'm better than that. If you're really wanting to make money, get out there and get a job. I had a, uh, I had a friend of mine, didn't, I, I, I guess our, our friendship was probably waning after this conversation, but I had a friend of mine who had no house, couldn't, you know, uh, really support himself, but had a car and a dog and was sleeping on people's couches. And they turned on a job, I believe it was at either McDonald's or Burger King because it wasn't what they wanted. They didn't like the conversation I had with them then. They said, well, I could have got a job over here at, I think it was Burger King. I could have got a job at Burger King, but I didn't want to do that. I want to do this other job. It's more high paying. I said, get off the couch, go work at Burger King, prove that you can do that, and then maybe the opportunity will open for the job that you actually want. Well, I don't want to do that. I said, you know what? You're lazy and you need to get off the couch. Well, how could you say that? I thought we were friends. I said, I'm saying that to you because I am your friend. Sometimes you need to have those hard conversations not only with your friends, but your family and different ones. And you go, you know what? Get off the couch, get a job, and do, you know, do something with your life. 
And I know that nowadays that the government's like, you know, I'll pay you more if you stay home. Don't give in to that. There's always a ploy with the government. There is. If you believe that the government is actually out to take care of you, no, they want, you know, they want your vote. They want who you are. They want everything about you to be indebted to them. The government right now, if you want to look at it this way, you say, well, pastor, how could you be saying this? Eh, I am. The government right now, if you want to look at it this way, is the biggest slave trader of all time. They want people to stay home doing nothing, you know, living off of them so they can tell you what to do. You have to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And the thing is, is that I've heard so many people say, well, you know what, it's slavery. Slavery is the fact of you depending upon the government. Freedom is the fact of you getting up and saying, you know what, I'm going to go to work because I want to actually earn what I, you know, everything that, you know, I want to be able to make money, that I earn it, and that, you know what, that's what I want to be able to do, is that I want to earn my way in life instead of the government just giving me a handout every time. And I know that's a dying breed nowadays, but the thing is, is that what, we need to realize that and do that because, you know what, if, if for anything, by you sitting at home, you're increasing your health risks and you're not helping yourself out. The Bible says, you know, for us to, to work, you know why? Because also our bodies are made to work. Our bodies are made to do things, are made to work, are made to go out and, you know, make a living. Why do you think that, you know, God says, you know what? You know, in the Garden of Eden, that he wanted man to go out, you know, into the fields and, you know what, and work. That's what he made our bodies for, is to work. And I understand there's different disabilities and different things out there and all those things as well. But the thing is, is that I've met people with disabilities that will still work because, you know what, they're like, I want to actually be able to earn what I keep. All right, my soapbox, I'm getting off of it now. But as it says, you know, in, that, in 2 Thessalonians, that if any would, work, would not work, neither shall they eat. I guarantee if the government stopped giving handouts, people would work. If people stopped, you know, uh, you know giving all this other stuff. If this is one of the, you know, the issues that, you know, that I see sometimes, is, and I've heard this from law enforcement, you know, in different places that I've been, they said if the church would not give, you know, you know, handouts as far as food and everything else, more people would work and there'd be less people on the street. Do you know why people go on the street? Is because they know that they can get a handout because the churches will go ahead and do it. It's a sad situation, but that's what ends up happening. All right, it, later in this verse he says that, uh, you know, forbearing, threatening. You know, some of you say, well, you know what, my boss threatens me. He says, well, you know what, that they are to, that your bosses are to forbear or to uh, be self-controlled and patient and to hold back. If they, if they want to, they're supposed to hold it back. As a believer, if you're a boss and you have an employee that, that is disgruntled or anything else, you're not supposed to sit there and start threatening them. Employers should, uh, sh- uh, and here's the other thing, employers shouldn't need to threaten believers into working. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and the employer has to like threaten you by like saying, you know what, I'm going to fire you if you don't start working, they shouldn't even have to get to that point. You should be wanting to work. You should be going there to work. Why? Because you're doing it as unto the Lord. Luke chapter 6, verse 31 says, And as uh, you would that men uh, should do to you, do ye also to them otherwise. In other words, this is where we get the golden rule. Uh, golden rule do unto others as you would have them do, do, to, uh, do to you. Do you want to invite somebody over to your house to help you do something, and they're lazy sitting on the couch eating all your food? Now think about that when you go to work. That we should do this, you know, you know, do one to others as we would do uh, do the other one. That if we don't want that to do it, then we shouldn't be doing the same thing, and we shouldn't be, you know, trying to live off the government. We should be doing all those things. We should go out and do and work as God's word, you know, tells us to. So, in other words, let me give an overview of everything, you know, that I, you know, talked about this morning. Is that for one thing, God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care what your skin color is. He doesn't care, you know, what your gender is, the two genders. Make that, you know, make that known. 
He doesn't care, you know, whether you're white, black, Chinese, male, female, whatever. He doesn't care about those things. He cares about, you know what, are you serving me? Are you loving me? Are you showing people, you know, the gospel? Are you t- telling people the gospel? Are you doing those things that would bring glory and honor and praise? That's what he cares about. Because you know, you know the reason why he brings this up is because it's the same thing in, in 2020 or 2022 now, 2022 as it was, a, you know, a couple thousand years ago when the Bible was written. People will say, well, you know, I'm better than you because I'm a king and you're, my, you're a peasant. Or they would go around and they'd use the same thing. Well, you know what? You know, I'm this color, you know, skin, and you're this color, so you're inferior to me. Does it sound familiar? It's been going on for 2,000, well, actually longer than that. But, God, you know, God's word has to, well, you know, put that in there because, you know what? It was happening at churches. And it's a sad reality when you, you walk into a church that is known as being a certain uh, skin color church. I can't go to that church because that's a white church. Or I can't go to that church because that's a black church. Or I can't go to that church because it's a Chinese church. Last time I checked, God, you know, when we get into heaven, says, from every nation, tribe, and tongue. It doesn't matter the skin color. It doesn't, you know, there shouldn't be a, uh, this is a men's only church, or this is a female only church, or this is this, this, this. It shouldn't matter at all. Why? Because God is not a respecter of persons. He wants you and you alone to serve him, to follow him, and to, to believe on him. Like I said, we are to be obedient, walking in the fear of the Lord with that holy awe and reverence when we work. Work as unto the Lord and not looking for the praise of men because the day of judgment, will re, uh, we will receive our reward for what we have done. God doesn't play any favorites. The only time it is okay to not do what your boss tells you to do is when it's in direct opposition to God's word. So if somebody tells you to lie, cheat, steal, not to pray, not to read your Bible, then the Bible says it is okay for you not to listen to, you know, not to follow what they say. But other than that, they tell you to work hard, you know, go put these, this stuff on the shelves, go put those fries in the fryer, go do whatever it takes. Do what they ask you to do. Don't give them an attitude. Just go out there and do it as unto the Lord because I guarantee you wouldn't do that to the Lord. You wouldn't go to him and be like, well, you can't tell me what to do. I saw a car going around town. I don't know whose it is, but there's one that says only God can judge me, and he will. God will judge us. The Bible says he, they will judge us you know, for the, whether the good or the bad that we have done, that, what, how we have lived our life you know, for the Lord. And I'm not using this as a scare tactic. I'm saying that God really does care about how we treat you know, our, our bosses and, and those you know, you know, that are beneath us as far as um, you know, maybe where they are at, if they're just a, you know, an employee as opposed to the employer or they're, whether they're a manager or whether they're a sales associate. God does not care those positions. We're to treat everyone. We're to treat you know, believers around us especially as unto the Lord. Amen? And so I had, you know, I have on here, you know, for an altar call, but my thing is, is that I think I'm just going to, you know, uh, you know, pray over you is that we need, you know, the altar call was to let's act like believers outside of the church building. Because I think oftentimes people will put on, you know, their, their best, their, they'll put their best foot forward when they come, you know, to church and when the pastor is around or when so-and-so is around or whatever, they'll, they'll go around, make sure everything is right. Then as soon as they leave church, I've met some people, you know, uh, you know, some of the things coming out of their mouth, you know, as soon as they come out of church, I was like, really? You were just, you were just, you know, praising the Lord. But for us as a, you know, as a body say, you know what, that I would get phone calls, you know, and I, I have, I've gotten phone calls where, hey, do you have anybody that needs a job? I need somebody that's good. Employers will call churches because they know that, you know, a particular, you know, they'll look at a particular church and say, you know what? Those people know how to work. I think this last week, actually, we just had a, a co-op thing for my daughter. And uh, they were talking about uh, you know, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A said, you know, came to, you know, came to this person. They know that they run the co-op. And the, and, and the person said, do you have anybody else in that co-op, in that homeschool, because we know that they're good workers? That's a lot to be said. Is that being, you know, 
That is, and that's being said here as well. Like I said, I've had calls about, hey, do you have a job for so-and-so? Or do you have this or this or this? And that's the, you know, how it should be. It should, you know, jobs, you know, places around here that are looking for jobs because nobody can say that there's no jobs out there. I've heard that argument. It's a lame argument. It has no, <laughs> there's, there's no validity to it at all because there's signs everywhere saying, now hiring. 